Colin McCann is here. He came to the United States from his native Ireland in 1986. His ambition was to live in America and write a novel. Seven books later, his novel, Let the Great World Spin, won the National Book Award in 2009. His new novel is called Transatlantic. It spans two continents in 150 years and blends the real with the imagined. I am pleased to have Colin McCann at this table. Welcome. I'm so pleased to be here. Oh, now let me just, just confess. Uh, hey, I'm in love with this because of characters I know, on the one hand, characters I'm familiar with. Um, and Ireland. Mm. This is such an old question, but what does it mean to be Irish? Well, that's, a, that, that, that's the original question. That's what we're asking ourselves all along. I mean, um, I suppose what it is that we, well, obviously we have this, this ancient and deep history. Uh, we, ha we have a, an ability to sing, an ability to tell the story, an ability, I suppose, to live our lives out loud. Yeah. And I quite like that. Um, and the Irish go everywhere, and they, we seem to embrace a lot of different uh, experience. Also, we have that sort of lurking sadness around. I know you used to um, interview Frank McCourt, and, yes, I did. and, and yeah. Frank had all of that. He had that big, brawling enthusiasm for the world. And at the same time, you could always tell that there's something behind there that recognizes history, that recognizes difficulty. And um, you know we're we're sort of together uh, as a, a as a nation, and um, it's it's um, it's good to be over here and to be Irish. Actually, I never miss interviewing an Irishman or an Irish woman. Uh, for example, I just had Graham McDowell from Northern Ireland, yeah. a great golfer. Fantastic you golfer. Know, a fantastic golfer. Right. I mean, and constantly we've had, whether they're, which side they're on, it didn't matter to me exactly. to talk about the conflict, to talk about people who tried to solve the conflict, yes. like George Mitchell, who's a character here, like, like Tony Blair, like, like, you know. Like, like, like Graham himself. Like Graham himself. Yeah, yeah. All, of these, all of these people, I mean, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that for 800 years we, 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 had, uh, we had difficulties in Ireland. And it came about in the late 1990s that everybody decided after 30 years of fl a complete flare out of the troubles that this was enough. But nobody knew how we were going to come together. And it took, uh, well, President Clinton to right. appoint Senator Mitchell right. and it took Senator Mitchell to go in there and listen to us because you know how we clatter on right you know it's just like for 700 like years talk. Yeah, exactly we're just going and and he went in and for two years he sat um, in in Stormont and he listened to us and he listened to every side not just two sides but four sides six sides sometimes eight sides he listened to them he listened to the women he listened to the children and his his beauty was that he embraced silence he allowed people to tell him what they felt and he didn't make any pronouncements until uh, in, he had his son, uh, son Andrew, yes. and five months into the peace process, he said, I have to go home. It is time. We've talked for years and years and years. It's 1998 on Good Friday, Easter time. Let's use the symbolism and let's have a peace agreement. And lo and behold, he worked it. Lots of people worked it. The canteen ladies worked right. it. You know, the, 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 the people who were driving cars, they worked it. Uh, Blair worked it, Ahern worked it, Jerry Adams right. worked it, McGuinness worked it. Right. But most of all, the glue that held it together was this American glue that was provided by Senator George Mitchell, an incredible man. Mm. And, and he's become, I assume, a friend of yours? He has become a friend of mine. Originally, funnily enough though, um, I, I went to him and his wife Heather and I said, I would like to, uh, to write about them and would they give me their blessing? Mm -hmm. And they said, sure enough, fair enough, um, you right, know. Right, right. And then, uh, Heather said to me, well, when would you like to meet the senator? And I said, I don't want to meet the senator. <laughs> no, and that was the beginning of a strange process. Like, uh, you want you to write about I want about to learn him. before I meet. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And so I wanted to, to intuit what it meant to be somebody like that. And I went away and I hid in my cubby hole and I imagined what it was to be him for about six months. And then I sent it to Heather and she, you know, she, she, she sent some stuff back to me, some, some, some fantastic notes, including the fact that he didn't wear brown shoes, but black shoes, yes. which was a great one. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, all these fantastic details and we built it up and built it up until eventually um, uh, she said to me, OK, we're ready to show it now to, to uh, her husband. Right. And then I had a five hour interview with him in his home. Right. And then later, uh, I spent three days with him in Maine, and my admiration for him increased 
each time. And, and I, you know, I was looking for something to find, something, you know, uh, off kilter. And Give you a little edge. Yeah, and this man's too nice, you know. <laughs> and he said to you in the end, oh, you're much too nice to me. Well, that's the thing. And this is the perfect response from, from a man like him, who's involved, who's conscious, who's humble and, 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 and gracious. What's he going to say? He said, you flattered me too much. He's not going to say anything else. I think it's yeah. the, it was the perfect response. But I think, and I hope, I, I caught him because history needs to catch him. Um, and history needs to learn from people like him. Because it's not just about mm. Northern Ireland, as you know. I mean, you know, it's about Colombia. You, you this know, it's brings about me places. to an interesting point. You, be about, uh, you believe that fiction can capture history. For you sure. You believe you learn as much about Ireland from Ulysses as you can any history book. For sure. For sure. Ulysses. Uh, set, as you know, on June 16, 1904, when my great-grandfather was alive. Now, I never met my great-grandfather, obviously, but I know he was the, almost the same age as Leopold Bloom, the character um, in, in the novel. Now, when I go in and read about Leopold Bloom walking the streets of Dublin, I can actually walk in my great-grandfather's body. Yes, right. And I can feel his blood pulsing through mine, not because I knew him, but because I knew Leopold Bloom. And this is the beauty of fiction. Not that, you know, at, there's not, history is fantastic and sociology is fantastic and all of these things together, I, I will never prioritize one or privilege one over the other. But fiction can get into the small moments where whatever it happens to be, Leopold Bloom turn in the corner, somebody brushing their teeth, somebody, you know, feeling a, 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 a hand on your face. These things that, that history doesn't necessarily write about, but they're small moments that build up and they make the large moments. Mm. And so I believe um, that, that, that fiction can create history. And I want, also... I want to come back how you used it here, but let me just stay with it. There are three storylines here, at least three storylines. Mm. One, the second is Frederick Douglass. That's right. What, why was he interesting? Because in 1845, the great man went to Ireland on a lecture tour. I, I, you know, I only learned about this story a few years ago, and at first when I heard it, that's incredible. Frederick Douglass, yeah. the great abolitionist, still a slave, yeah. in 1845 takes a ship, he's not even allowed to go first class, even though he has enough money to pay first class, um, takes a ship and lands in Dunleary, in a port in Dublin. And I thought, wow, a black man going to Ireland in 1845, what was that like? Well, he was uh, taken in by the, the establishment and the Anglo-Irish, and they took him all around the country where he gave these fantastic lectures uh, um, to great halls of people, met Daniel O'Connell, right. our great liberator. However, a huge crisis of conscience for him, and I think this is where the story becomes really profound and beautiful and contradictory, um, and where fiction can sort of enter it. At the same time, the famine was unfolding yeah, right. in our country. And he, he saw worse poverty than he'd ever seen in the South. And the three million people enslaved, enslaved in America, he thought, well, the Irish had it much worse off. And so his dilemma was, do I speak out on behalf of the poor Irish when my hosts are the ones who are sort of holding this uh, you know, mm. undemocratic uh, moment in place? Or do I cleave to my people? And I was annoyed at him because you know, publicly he didn't speak out on behalf of the poor Irish. At first I was annoyed at him. Then I began to realize what a beautiful gesture it was to his own history and to his, his own people. And also that he, he can't hold a million, he can't take on the conscience of the, of the whole world. Douglas was a most incredible person on, you know, Douglas and Mitchell both. Um, as you know, he spoke out on behalf of women's rights a oh, yeah. hundred years before anybody else. And he, he gave birth to the civil rights movement over here. And he was fantastic. And, and, and what he did in Ireland was, was profound too. The third leg of this is the, the people who from Newfoundland went transatlantic to mm -hmm. Ireland. Right. The first yeah. before Charles Lindbergh, right. transatlantic flight. Yeah. Why them? The, John, John Alcock and Arthur Whitten Brown. I, I was just on a flight, um, you know, coming from, from Dublin uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was thinking, this chicken here is very tepid, you know, it's like, you know, and then, I, then I had to remember that the very flight, uh, the very first flight was, was, was two RAF men who had come out of that bath of dying that was the First World War, 25 million dead, and uh, they, they took a, a Vickers Vimy, 
Okay. They redesigned it, uh, replaced the bomb bays with uh, petrol tanks. In other words, took the war out of the machine and they flew across the ocean for 17 hours, open cockpit, the tip ends of their hair <laughs> freezing. Yeah. I know them shivering there, a little bit of brandy, yeah. uh, a couple of sandwiches. And here I was thinking, yes, this chicken is... <laughs> isn't, <laughs> isn't, isn't, no. how, spo how spoiled do we get? Yeah. But it was a beautiful journey. And, and a profound journey, and, and it was the linking of the continents to the air. They also carried the very first transatlantic mail. Did they have fabric, really, as far as the it was cloth? It was, it was cloth, right? Cloth made in Northern Ireland, linen, yeah. linen cloth, and held together with wood, a couple of screws, and two huge Rolls Royce engines. If you can imagine yeah. here, two Rolls Royce engines in front of you for 16 hours, going tud 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 tud. Imagine what your, your ears would feel like yeah. at the end of it all. Now, married with that are these non, these fictional characters, mm. women. Women. A family. Yes. Four generations. So what are you doing here? What am I what doing? What is this art form? Oh, well, sometimes um, I say, people ask me, what's your novel about? And I say, it's about 300 pages. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because the thing is that, 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 that they, they come to it and they, they interpret it uh, for, for you. And sometimes you leave this, th these landscapes open so that people can walk into it. You know, if I'm too conscious of what it is that I want to say, if I'm lecturing or being didactic about my, my, my themes, they suddenly become uninteresting. Because mm -hmm. what I want people to do is to live in the pulse of the moment. In other words, I want them to be on that flight. I want them to be in with Mitchell. I want them to be farming ice with a woman in, 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 in Missouri in the 1850s and 1880s. 1960s. But if I were to talk uh, about what I really want to do, I want to question what's real, question what's imagined, and then talk about uh, history and talk about empathy and decency. So, I, I, And also the role of women in all of this, which I think is incredibly important. Because for a long time we have uh, ascribed history to men. Mm. Uh, we, the men have taken over history. They believe they be they, they are the perpetrators in most of our historical events. But what about the, the, the women who are there? They're really the proper glue between, mm -hmm. uh, between all of these events. And they are the ones who, you know, who got out in the streets. And you know, they're the women in Argentina who are walking with the photographs of the disappeared. They're the women uh, who comp you know, got out in the 1970s in Ireland and said, enough of this slaughter, enough of this blood and bone all over the place. I want my child back home. And Mitchell knew this. Mitchell was really well aware that he would have preferred to have 3,600 mothers in you know, talking about Northern Ireland because 3,600 of them lost their sons and daughters. He didn't want to listen to the men rattling on and on and on. And part of his beauty was he gave back our peace, our country, to the people who, who, were, who were rightfully sort of in charge. And he of knew they were tired of war. Oh, yeah. But everybody's, everybody's tired of war. I mean, and, and in particular, women throw up their hands and say, and, but it seems to me that they, they, they are the ones to whom we must listen. If you take Irish history and even just recent Irish history, um, you know, Mary Robinson and Mary McAleese have been so fantastic about like excising the wounds and saying, okay, come on, to, let's put a candle in the window. Let's look at ourselves. Let's have a more nuanced, uh, you know, think about who we happen to be and um, you know it I like actually strangely enough I don't know what this means and I don't want the the psychoanalyst to put me on the couch with it but but I love writing about women and I love well, it is said that you write more that you more than anybody a they say that you can write in a woman's voice better than you can even write in a men's voice and that no one no man who writes does it better than you wow. so I let's assume some of that's right yeah, I, don't, okay. I don't think so but okay but, but let's assume that's right yeah. um why do you think it is what is it that gives you the talent to hear the experience and the voice of women and put them in a novel well i love the idea of of otherness and, and I also, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I have a good life. I have a really good life. I've got, I've, I've got three kids. You know, I, I, I live in New York. I come from Ireland. Um, I got a wonderful family. Um, and, but I wake up in the morning, and I don't necessarily want to be me. 
I like the fact that I can step away and become other. When I wrote Let the you Great World Spin, in, inside, the, inside my head right. and inside a book. When I wrote Let the Great World Spin, um, I remember I was writing about um, a 38-year-old hooker in the Bronx right. and my kids would come knocking on the door and they say, come on, Dad, let's go for a game of football in, in, in the park. And I'd say, you know, I'd, in my imagination, say to myself, I'd say, hold on a minute, I'm just turning a trick under the Deegan here. G- <laughs> give me five minutes and I'll be out playing football in the park. In other words, I, what I like to do is go in and, and, and imagine what it means to be, uh, to be that person. And, and the more sort of anonymous that person happens to be, the more attractive they are to me. Mm. Uh, so the small little corners uh, of, of, of human experience, if I can get there. So it's not hard for you? Not hard for me at, at all. all. Well, I mean, to write are, in one's voice. You know, I'm tired of writers telling you how, 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 or telling me how, how hard it is and that they have to hide away and everything like that. Sure, it's hard. But a lot of things are hard. It's hard to do this. It's hard to be a cop on the street. Yeah. It's hard to drive a subway train. Yeah. Um, to do it well. And I don't. And all of them. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so uh, I don't like to talk about how how difficult it is. I feel that I have a gift, and and, and I got to run with the gift. And if I can imagine what it feels like to be a woman living on Park Avenue, or to be a woman like farming ice in in, in Missouri, um, then let it be. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to examine because if I know that the secret behind it. Um, I think I mightn't be able to do it again. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about, I'll show you this. Just back to George. I want to do this now because I'll forget about doing it. This is Senator McGovern talking about the very things that you'll hear from him in the book, Roll Tape, at this table. The Queen was uh, knighting me. It's honorary because only a British citizen can use the title. And by an awful coincidence, at the time we were meeting with the Queen, the process in Belfast was collapsing. Uh, and when I came out and had a press conference, of course, the reporters said, uh, how do you feel about uh, being honored for a peace process that just collapsed? And I said, of course, I feel very badly. Are you embarrassed? Well, yes, of course, I'm very embarrassed. And so instead of celebrating that night, my wife and I went back to the hotel to watch the news on television, which was all bad news about the events in Belfast. And that night I got a call from the British Secretary of State and from the Prime Minister of Ireland, asked me British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. For Northern Ireland, right. asked me if I would uh, go back, and I really didn't want to do it because I'd been there for years, uh, and I talked about it with my wife. And finally, she said to me, she said, "You've got to go back because if you don't, and the war resumes, you will never forgive yourself." And that really was the most telling argument that uh, I was in a position where I could possibly be of assistance. And if I said no and the war resumed, I would have it on my conscience forever. So even though there wasn't much prospect at the time and most people felt it couldn't work, I felt I've got to give it my best effort, which I did. You think he is the best embodiment of what a politician can and should be? Yeah, I think he's an, uh, an amazing man. I think if we had a number of George Mitchells, um, we would be so much better off in terms of imagining what it means to be other, being empathetic, being uh, progressive, uh, being having a conscience, and doing doing all these things. How he survived in the world of politics is is sort of amazing to me. But he has that sort of old New England uh, sort of dignity and charm, yeah. and he doesn't attempt to yeah. to he sort of draw attention. Have, but it should be said that he probably could have been there as long as one or two the people of, of uh, Maine loved him and sure. he could return to the Senate and turn down the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, yeah. You know, uh, thought about it, a whole range of things that he could have done. Uh, he also was a special envoy for. President Obama into the into the Middle East. Right. This novel ends with Obama's 2011 trip to Ireland. Right. Why that? What well, does it mean? I, first of all, because I start out with, or, or chronologically, it starts out with the, uh, with Douglas coming right. to Ireland. I wanted to finish it and bump it right up against the present. I don't like the idea of, of writing an historical novel, and I believe that history is relevant to today, and also history changes according to the present moment that you're in. And it seemed to me that one of the greatest moments in contemporary Irish history was the week when the Queen of England and President Obama, in, inside one week, both went to Ireland. Mm. And they were embraced, they were adored. And Obama went there, he said he dropped the apostrophe, 
<laughs> from the Obama yeah. Oh, area, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and pe- pe- people loved them. <laughs> but the thing is, people were terrified about the Queen's visit, yeah. uh, and they thought, okay, there's going to be riots, there's going to be lo- lots of things going on. No. She came and she bowed her head at the Garden of Remembrance. She, uh, she was embraced by the Irish people. She spoke in Irish. And it was a crystallising moment for what Mitchell had done. It was to say this peace process is in place. Who's to say that it, it won't, you know, things won't flare up again? But I believe they won't. We'll have isolated moments of violence and maybe some Molotov cocktails and some questions about flags and so on. But I believe that that week when Obama and, and the Queen were there, that was a total justification of this whole transatlantic uh, uh, series of relationships and also. Uh, I have to say that that um, I, I hope American people can can see that that um, America was going outwards in, in in an extraordinary way. Everybody talks about this country being insular, about its politics like shrinking inwards. But the truth of the matter is, still to this very day, we're going to uh, we're trying to help out in 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 all sorts of places, especially the Middle East, but in Northern Ireland, it was achieved, and everybody has to take a bow because peace is a great story. But it's also, I think, the hardest story to maintain. You have become a huge sort of apostle for storytelling. Yes. Doing what? Well, I'm involved with this brand new charity, which is called Narrative 4. Um, And basically what we want to do is we want to bring kids from all different parts of the world, from Haifa, from Belfast, from New Orleans, from Chattanooga, from Chicago, bring them together and not just have them tell their stories, but have them inhabit the shoes of others. So they exchange stories with one another in what we call a leap of radical empathy. So that we, we're hoping that we can expand the lungs of the world by having these kids get together, telling the, each other their essential stories and then trying to understand one another and maybe in that way we'll you know see a new George Mitchell come along we'll see a new uh, a new Douglas come along and uh, you know and there's lots of people doing really good things in the world mm. as you know um, and this is just one small thing where we bring uh, lots of artists together Salman Rushdie's involved right. uh, Sting has been right. involved uh, we have all sorts of writers like helping us out Ian McEwan right. Taya Obrecht um, uh, about 106 writers uh, came together gave us a free piece of fiction to, to use Alexander Heyman all these fantastic people uh, Luis Urea is, 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 is my partner in crime. He's the Mexican novelist who lives in Chicago. Um, and we, f- we, we, we created this um, with a number of different people. And it is, it's working. It's really working. Finally, there's this. A teacher from Newtown, Connecticut, mm. after the terrible tragedy there, contacted you and said that he had assigned Let the Great World Spin as a reading project. Pick up the story. This man's name is Lee Keelock. Um, probably, uh, you know, I have a huge regard for teachers. My wife is a teacher. You know, my great friend Frank McCourt was, a, was, was an incredible teacher. This man is an incredible teacher. He teaches at the high school in Newtown. And um, he saw firsthand what happened to not only the young kids, but the older kids, the ones who survived, the ones who babysat the kids, the ones who lost their brothers, their sisters. And he is interested in healing. He's interested in this notion of, of empathy. And he feels that he can do it through literature, and which is an incredible thing. The fact that literature can matter, your story matters. And so uh, amazingly, and I have to say, I, I, you know, it was one of the greatest days of my literary life. He, he got in touch with me and said he wanted to use let the great world spin for the kids in order for them to navigate their grief mm-hmm. um, in relation to what had happened. And so they could talk to counsellors, talk to themselves, talk to other people. And then he invited me up to the school where he, uh, I sat with, you know, now, for you, hours and hours. Were you ready to go in the beginning or were you reluctant in the first? No, I was ready You're to ready go. You ready to go? I was ready okay. to go. The minute he said it to me, yeah. I, I, I was ready to go. I was scared. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know what I would say. In the end, I didn't have to say all that much. The kids all said it. They said, we were in a dark place. We're looking for a bit of light. 
um, you know, uh, how do we achieve a modicum of light? You know, how do we think our way out of this? How do we act our way out of this? How do we become better people? And it was extraordinary. The electricity in that classroom, as I listened, so I was lucky. I yeah. wasn't talking to them. I had nothing yeah. to say. Listen. I learned how to listen to them. And, and, and it, it, it broke my heart. And, 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 but it healed it too, you know, in certain ways. They got a chance to talk and they'll keep on talking. They'll be talking for the rest of their lives. They'll have to. But as long as somebody's there to listen to them, um, I think that's the, that's the big achievement. Yeah. Listeners play a role. Absolutely. Uh, Transatlantic, a novel uh, by Colin McCann, winner of the National Book Award. And the book that he won the National Book Award for was called Let the Great World Spend. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.